No worries. Okay, guys, let's get started. So it's an incredible pleasure to have Dick Bond as today's speaker. He made fundamental contributions to the theory and measurement of primordial fluctuations and of later time cosmological evolution and, and the development of structure in the universe. Um, in doing this, he developed a unified um, methodology involving stochastic processes and entropy, as we will see in today's slides. Um, and it's not an exaggeration to say that much of what we know about the um, history of the universe, including concrete constraints on physics that happened 14 billion years ago almost, um, are due to Dick and his methods and those of his collaborators. So Dick was a Caltech PhD in the 70s. He was a professor here in the 80s before he went back to his home base of Canada to lead the Canadian Institute of Theoretical Astrophysics at the University of Toronto, where he still works. Um, he has an enormous list of awards. It would take the entire talk to describe them all, honestly. So let me um, just pick a small sample. Um, in 2005, he was given the Order of Canada. I think he's some sort of knight. <laughs> Related to that, possibly in 2012, he received the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal. Um, he is also a foreign associate of our own National Academy of Sciences. Uh, he won the Gruber Prize in Cosmology, uh, the Alexander von Humboldt Research Award, which is Germany's highest scientific honor, um, and uh, the Canadian Association of Physicists Medal for Lifetime Achievement in Physics. Now, this isn't everything. I mean, his individual scientific contributions are incredible enough, but Dick is one of those rare people who's made an equally transformative impact on the field as a whole on other scientists, um, especially in astrophysics and cosmology, uh, including the major Canadian efforts like CETA already mentioned, and something called CIFAR. So here you might be familiar with these these newfangled Simons collaborations in various areas of, of physics. And incidentally, we're very delighted to have Dick in our new one on early universe cosmology here. Um, but this is not a new thing. Can Canadians have been doing this for years. It's called CIFAR. And Dick leads the longest running, incredibly successful one on cosmology and gravity until very recently due to perhaps some issue with term limits. He, he turned it over to uh, Vicky Caspi. And uh, it's made incredible synergistic progress in a number of areas well beyond Dick's own research. So Dick is visiting us for a couple of months here as a Hanna visiting professor. So this program was established recently by the family of Stan Hanna, um, who was a longtime member of this department in his honor. And it's meant to bring eminent scholars to Stanford for extended periods. And Dick is certainly fits the bill for this. So take it away. Can you give me 20, 15, 25 so I can paste it? Well, it's a... Uh, am I on? I can speak loudly anyway. Um, it's a tremendous uh, pleasure to be back at Stanford, one of my favorite places. Uh, and it's not just the weather escaping from Toronto, it is the uh, incredible intellectual richness across such a wide variety of subjects that one uh, delves into whenever you come um, here. And uh, since I go back a long way with Stanford, I might say it's especially an honor to be a Hannah scholar because I knew Stan Hanna, he was a nuclear physicist, and I grew out of nuclear physics, um, uh, having been a graduate student of Willie Fowler's at Caltech, and so we got to rap about nuclear physics back in the 80s, and he was a delightful personality, and I'm really pleased that he, um, that in his honor, there is this uh, visiting program here, which uh, I think is, uh, is great. Um, right. So let us just begin. Um, what I would have talked about is the latest Planck uh, cosmic microwave satellite results that were going to come out in December of 2017. 
It is into March. They were supposed to come out on March 31st, 2018. And if we're lucky, we will see April 2018. But actually, that's not such an awful forecast. It is quite likely. So uh, that, and we're working hard on another great experiment, uh, Advanced ACPOL, which has got some fabulous results, but still under wrap, and that'll take a little longer to get out. And uh, we're also still working on the spider balloon-borne data, in spite of the fact that the flight was 2015. Its target is to search for R. You have your own R-searching uh, uh, machine here with uh, Shaolin Kuo. Um, and uh, uh, it's wonderful data set that we have, not nearly the amount of data that uh, Bicep Keck has, that's uh, Shaolin's thing, but uh, we aren't ready to come out with that. So I am in a state of unreadiness, and so I thought that what I would do is one, maybe set the stage for the things that are coming, and two, take you on a rather grandiose and perhaps overly ambitious path through various uh, uh, realms of the universe, but using a unifying theme which I've used for a number of years, which is information theory, uh, entropy, and the new and not new catchphrase on this is that the entropy is ordered, and order parameters are going to be one of the subjects of the day, not that you haven't thought about this yourself a lot, it's just that maybe you haven't thought about it in quite this way. So. Uh, Whenever somebody starts with a cosmology talk, they pull out you know, a basic WMAP thing that sort of shows the history of the universe with a few pretty pictures. Nobody shows it quite like I do. Uh, <laughs> starting here, um, this is part of a snake, a happy snake, who has a tail that goes back here to the ultra early universe, inflation, and the idea is that along the tail are all of the uh, realms of cosmic history looking back to the issues of origins that's called the Oberobus uh, and it has been used a number of times in cosmology and, uh, and that is what this suite basically is. So we have this observer looking out upon the past, remarkable things that we can learn as much about the past as, as we do and so uh, Every place you see the Superman sign, don't think of Superman, or maybe you could call it uh, super because it's entropy. And it is showing where the entropy in matter and radiation are created at different epochs in the expansion. This is our current view. There could be other epochs associated with dramatic first order phase transitions in the early universe history. But the story we have right now is that almost all of the ma entropy in matter was generated in a transition from inflation through to an incoherence that ultimately led to the quark gluon plasma uh, back at a time 13.8 giga years ago minus 10 to the minus 50 uh, and so obviously there's a lot of hubris in physicists, as you know very well. Uh, and so there is an incredible amount of, and a really exciting uh, intellectual study of how you go from a coherent effective condensate into a essentially chaotic state that passes through transitions, a decidedly non-equilibrium and in fact non-thermal equilibrium process. And that's where the entropy gets generated and if you're gonna count it, you've gotta count that. Uh, the universe then does its thing, hadronization, all of that, produces nuclei. It's still got a lot of photons and neutrinos in it. They are where the entropy is stored of the universe that was created back here. And there's a little bit of entropy that's created when the neutrinos decouple. This is the famous, well, not three minutes, but more like a few seconds up to a minute or so. And that is occurring through a viscosity as they are trying to uh, interact and escape with the, uh, the matter. It's not a really big deal. But there are interesting signatures we might be able to find from that epoch. It's a broad brushstroke thing uh, because the major uh, 
uh, observable we have at that epoch is Big Bang nucleosynthesis, the products, mostly helium and deuterium and, and lithium and a few others. And of course, uh, Bob Wagoner in the audience here is the master of that subject. And we've been working on this recently uh, at CETA with uh, actually Willie Fowler's last graduate student. So his second to last and last are actually uh, coupled together on neutrino decoupling. Fun era. Then, of course, the universe, uh, first of all, the photons uh, uh, get into a Planck state. We're very interested in whether there may or may not be a distortion associated with that and whether there might be some kind of entropy injection in that period prior uh, uh, to when the photons actually decouple. The decoupling, and you know this story very well, happens at about a redshift 1100. And um, uh, there are all of these processes of relevance going on that um, uh, do in fact cause a little bit of entropy generation, but not a huge amount as far as we know. Uh, and it's mainly because of viscous coupling between the photons and the uh, electrons um, as they start to decouple. And so you get some entropy generation there. It's associated with damping. It's associated with, in fact, what has been termed silk damping. It's viscous damping. And it's in a very, very important signature in the microwave background. So then decoupling occurs over um, a width about 17 kiloparsecs in size. Um, relative to this huge distance out to the horizon. Uh, in terms of co-moving distance, is about 20 megaparsecs. And so, because it's fuzzy, that's also a cause of the breakout uh, causing um, damping. Um, so there's entropy generation there, but pretty small. Then the photons propagate. The characteristic scale you know well is the baryon acoustic scale, the thing that provides the measurement stick through cosmic time that tells us a lot about the subsequent dynamical history of the universe. Uh, and there is this period that's been dubbed the Dark Ages uh, when you have a very simple system which is a, effectively a linear response system which is the evolution of the photons, the neutrinos, etc. They're responding linearly to the uh, fluctuations that were laid down in the uh, pre-heating uh, period in the inflationary epoch. So it's just linear response theory. But then nonlinearity develops and that creates what we call the cosmic web, weakly nonlinear and then fully nonlinear, quite complex, but it is what causes light bulbs to shine up and therefore we get to see things. So this generates what are called secondary anisotropies as opposed to the primary anisotropies that reflect exactly the um, uh, fluctuations laid down in inflation. So do the secondary anisotropies but in a complex way which I will be describing as we go along. Uh, so nonlinear evolution, one of the things that occurs is that the light cones are, uh, are um, uh, corrugated um, and that creates a weak lens, there's a weak lensing uh, phenomenon in which the light is bent, that creating a huge study uh, both um, using galaxies to do it or, or microwave background to do it. That's opened up a lot, especially with the Planck data and the ACT data and the SPT data. And so that's been an exciting subject. There is something called the thermal Sinyayev Zadovich and kinetic Sinyayev Zadovich effects. These all sound very mysterious. It's always got names. I like when people throw away the names and just give an encapsulation of what is the physics words that you're describing. Guess what? It's Compton scattering. So uh, the thermal effect, there's a slight change in the energy of the photons that are coming towards us as it scatters off a of hot gas. And for the kinetic Sinyayev-Zoldovich effect, that isn't so important. It's mostly that, they, that they're um, scattering off of moving uh, electrons. There are other effects which I won't get into. But then in the development of nonlinearity, we have all of the... Uh, Apart from the formation of galaxies, etc., we have the formation of, um, of stars, and uh, and so you see, I've got uh, 
the nuclear sign there to indicate that that's the source of a lot of the energy and one of the and then uh, there is a Hollywood star here, which I don't think really describes the physics of what's going on, but um, uh, there is also a lot of accretion energy onto the black holes that have formed from these times and as they accumulate. And so um, the interesting thing about that is that galaxies are replete with dust, and the dust uh, uh, absorbs the high quality radiation and it then shoves it down into a thermal emission, mostly, um, which is called the cosmic infrared background. And it's a huge source of uh, background radiation, which uh, took some time for us to, to find, but uh, what we have done with Planck in uh, trying to separate it out and make maps of the cosmic infrared background has really been quite tremendous in my view because you have to separate it from the dust in the galaxy. So it's a huge source and because it takes high quality, high energy radiation and shoves it into something whose temperature is of order 30 degrees Kelvin, it uh, does that by creating a huge amount of entropy. So in terms of the entropy budget of the universe in matter, um, it is mostly in the neutrinos and the photons, about equal amounts. And, um, and then more to a first approximation, the rest is in uh, uh, the CIB. And then there are other, of course, relevant things like all of the hot stuff in clusters, et cetera, also an entropy generation process. And there's an entropy generation process which you probably have not really thought of as an entropy generation process, which is the transition as dark matter, let's call it cold for the sake of it, comes together and uh, in the collapse and formation of an uh, object, it does not actually create entropy. It gets entangled in phase space so that if you look at it with sort of coarse-grained eyes, you say, oh, well, in this little coarse-grained region, some are moving that way, some are moving that way, some are moving that way, in spite of the fact that it's actually quite a regular motion, orbits. Um, and so you say, ah, there is entropy in that region. It is the analog of entropy creation. It's in a classical dynamical system. And that's one of the things which is so exciting about playing around with entropy is that, you know, the coarse grain vision is absolutely fundamental. But of course, as you know, that's the fundamental vision of more or less all of physics now called effective field theory or uh, whatever. And, essentially every subject. Okay, now I'm going to say, well, oh, by the way, uh, uh, dark energy starts to dominate at ridiculously low redshift. It's about 0.5 or so. So that before that, e even though it's got a role, it's mostly being defined by the dynamics of the dark matter. And the dark energy then starts to pick up. So, of course, who ordered that? Well, some, something ordered that. We're looking through the Milky Way, that's a complication. So it gives us a dusty screen to the universe, but we deal with that. And I just want to say all of these things have net entropy creation, entropy positive. And then we humans take in all of these bits from the universe and then we, um, first of all, try and compress them into something meaningful. But the thing that happens with every experiment we get, we get more knowledge, more order, and the entropy is actually decreasing. So we are cooling down the universe, such as it is, or at least in terms of the knowledge sense. And I'll get into that a little bit more. So you can see, I hope, that the theme of entropy is really fun to play with in trying to unify things. So I'll take a look at this diagram again in terms of a clock not the usual clock of the time down here, but E-foldings. That, of course, anybody who's played with inflation knows that that's the story of the day, the log of the expansion factor of the universe. And um, the interesting thing is that where we get essentially all of the information about the dark energy comes from an E-folding about one. That is to say, we don't get to go very deep with the dark energy. And in fact, that's very limiting in the amount of 
uh, information that we can get from it. Nonetheless, humans have decided to spend more or less billions of dollars on satellites, LSSTs, etc., to try and get the essence of this because it's such an important problem. Uh, so I'm listing here some of the probes. Obviously, you know about the supernova 1A associated with uh, lambda, the cosmological constant, or the dynamical expansion, the gravitational lensing. Uh, I have the symbol H naught there. What does that mean? Uh, well, we all know there's a bit of controversy about that, uh, which has just been exacerbated in the last week or so. Um, so this is fun. Uh, baryon acoustic oscillations, those are being used now to map out the dynamics of the universe rel relative to, uh, um, or, or actually the geometry of what happened back here. And so you have these images of the barren acoustic oscillations which give you a snapshot of what happens and so you can learn about dark energy and other things. Uh, clusters of galaxies are also essentially in this E-folding. Uh, and then there are other important issues like the dark energy becoming important. Um, and CMB lensing is actually from a, a wide range, a little bit above, but it's not really very important by E-folding number two. So E-folding number two is extremely interesting because that's the period where uh, a lot of the galaxies are being assembling, assembled, but that's uh, back here. And by uh, E-folding three, there is essentially very little, if any, structure um, and so we are sort of at the end of the dark ages. Then at E-folding 7, we're back to the um, uh, epoch where the photons decoupled, the recombination um, uh, surface, fuzzy surface that it is, and the end of inflation, and we can, if we think we know something about the particle content, actually count the number of E-foldings back to the end of inflation, which is somewhere around 67. And then, as you've probably heard, people think that the observable range of structures that was created in inflation is about 60 E-folds beyond that. Maybe it's 50, maybe it's 60, could even be 40. We don't really, well, of course we don't really know, you know, hubris and all that. But that just gives you an idea of how all of this is playing out. Uh, in terms of a different way of looking at the time. Uh, don't worry. I'm showing this because those who have seen me give talks before know that I'm famous. And this particular one is doing all of uh, uh, non-equilibrium statistical physics on one slide and information theory for that matter. Well, not exactly all. Okay, uh, but that isn't the one I'm going to begin with. I'm going to black some things out to make it a little easier for you. But I have a small tale that uh, uh, Bob Wagoner may appreciate. So I've been known for these colorful slides throughout much of my career. And um, I gave a talk uh, in Cambridge and Sarah Arseth, the great dynamicist, came up and he said, uh, do you know what the unit is for slides? They're called willies. Because Willie Fowler, our uh, good friend and my advisor and Bob's uh, 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 postdoc uh, advisor at Caltech, uh, was known for his complicated slides. So I actually get it from a legitimate thing. And so just consider that this is on that Richter scale a milli willy as opposed to <laughs> So uh, I love that story because I can now defend the thing that I do without thought, anyway. Um, okay, so I could wax eloquent on the information story a lot. Um, you know who this is, uh, Johnny Wheeler, who embraced the information ideas that were put forward by Shannon with the following uh, line, and he was old then, this was done in the 70s, and did the famous it from bit and all that stuff which I've added from bits in it. The bits are the bits that we observe. The it is the universe. Fun, fun, fun. Um, now I am in the grip of a new vision that everything is information. The more I have pondered the mystery of the quantum and our strange ability to comprehend this world in which we live, 
the more I see possible, possible fundamental roles for logic and information as the bedrock of physical theory. Then what I love the most is the end of the line, I continue to search, and so that is what we're doing. Okay, so, um, uh, oh, I want to introduce another thing called information quality as opposed to entropy, which is information content. This is probably the essence of information. It is the essence. Um, okay, it from bit. So, uh, as I discussed with Eva, one of the problems in this world is if you state an equation in English, then uh, it can mean many things. And so there is this famous line uh, from Marshall McLuhan, as in Marshall McLuhan, what you're doing, uh, that will be an age indicator of whether you saw any of the comedy things from back in the late 60s. Um, the medium is the message. Okay, the medium is the message, and it was uh, describing the global village and its interaction, and it had a large, large impact. But if you think about it here, the message is the underlying bedrock for the media. I'm just playing with the words, right? So that's the problem with the words. So let's go back to the equations. Um, this is the relative sh Shannon entropy between um, this... Uh, uh, probability density and, uh, and another one, I. It is also called the negative of the kullback liebler divergence, very well known for many, many people. And um, it's actually composed of two parts. The probability density functional is a rho f, and it's also got the metric that exists on the measure space. And it is the combination which is the uh, important set of variables. And in my uh, attempts to do non-equilibrium entropy, I certainly had a, an amount of confusion on that, which I like to think has left me. Um, and so the entropy is this quantity, but it can be thought of in terms of two terms. One is uh, actually, it's the integral of, because there was a stupid naming procedure, of something called the Kolmogorov sinai entropy, which is appearing all the time in dynamical systems. And uh, uh, Steve Shanker there is probably f very familiar because they are, he's a chaotic guy these days. Um, and so there is also essentially something associated with the difference in the metrics, uh, which is the trace of a strain. And this thing can grow in spite of the fact that you have adiabaticity. That is to say, the entropy is different. So what that means in a chaotic system, in a ballistic system, uh, you can have a strain between two points where they go away from each other exponentially. Obviously, that seems to make a lot of complexity. But it is not, I mean, that's chaos, right? But that's not included in Shannon's entropy. It's included in the KS entropy, and that's what it's measuring. It's essentially associated with the uh, trace of the strain, which is essentially trying to decide what the largest eigenvalues are and how they're behaving in time. Anyway, it now turns out that in much of what we're doing in cosmology, the Kolmogorov sinai entropy plays, in our view, an equally important role to the other entropy in that it's characterizing a lot of uh, aspects of complexity. Um, so there's generalized parameter space, and you all know that there's a relationship of Shannon's entropy to the quantum entropy, which is the von Neumann with the density matrix, and I'm not going to talk about that at all today. Um, the third floor of Varian buzzes with this uh, uh, all the time. That's uh, a fantastic subject. Um, I'm going to just say that there are other kinds of entropy that people like to play with, uh, but I'm not sure they're actually thinking, well, certainly not thinking about it exactly the way I am. Uh, there is something called Renier entropy that uh, arises all the time, which is associated with how clumped in phase space the densities are, and so there's a sequence of measures of those clumpings in density. We've actually used it to some success in characterizing the interior structure of clusters, so it's kind of amusing. But it also turns out to be the 
um, generating functional or generating function for um, entropy fluctuations, which are as important as mean entropies. Entropy fluctuations are playing an important role. Certainly, um, they are the things that can drive non-equilibrium phenomena. Okay, so you can see I could talk about that kind of stuff for a long time. Now I'm going to talk about the Bayesian chain. So what we have is we've got a prior probability. We have, and D here is data. So these are parameters. They may be cosmic parameters or they could be parameters characterizing the state of inflation or whatever. Uh, alphas here are what I'm calling controlled parameters. So they are impositions from above, outside, of the system which can control the state of the thermodynamics inside. Then there is something that depends upon the data. It's called the likelihood function. And the transition from that to the posterior probability is a transition that anybody who's played with data knows and loves. And then to normalize things properly, there's something called the evidence, which is doing the appropriate integration here. It's effectively a partition function, or from my point of view, it's uh, related to a free energy. And the data doesn't just have to be microwave background or large-scale structure or supernova data. It could be a really big data statement like um, the universe has to be complex for us to be in this patch of the universe. Or the more uh, um, detailed statement is that uh, life that's sentient must exist. Um, and so that, as we know, through the anthropic principle is used heavily, sometimes uh, religiously. Uh, but I won't use it that way. So now let me talk a little bit more about this term. The probability of data given the cosmic parameters, or the likelihood. Um, if you have a series of experiments, then usually the way it works is there's a product likelihood. You say that this experiment didn't really depend upon this experiment or this experiment. And so you consider that there is a sequence. It may be time ordered, but from the point of view of updating, it doesn't matter. And the way you can express this is that the uh, entropy uh, going from the prior state to the final state uh, from uh, prior to posterior is composed of a bunch of little entropy fluctuations that supposedly are going to take you towards cosmic truth as your experiments keep getting better and better and better. But that isn't always the case and that will bring us to the uh, the key words that I want to talk about today which are called tensions in the game where you may have two experiments that are indicating two things and so those experiments they've got their fluctuations around them and the question is are they compatible or are they not and it may be that they're pointing to a bifurcation in your understanding of the system so that a new parameter arises and this was in fact the discussion we just had about um, maybe the new supernova, or sorry, the new um, uh, Cepheid type variable analyses that seem to give a somewhat higher h naught in our local region is actually going to emerge as an important property as opposed to something as just because the statistics hasn't been well understood, in which case what you would get is an emergence. And the emergence would be a new control parameter that you haven't thought of before, which is fun. I mean, that's, of course, what we're after. Um, and as I have mentioned already, the thing about the uh, mean transition entropy is that it is decreasing. Um, and that is an indication that the volume of parameters space has contracted as we've learned more and more and more about the system. And where this doesn't quite work is when there is uh, disagreement within the different experiments. The control parameters uh, comes under the general um, uh, word of uh, uh, theory prior, but here I'm injecting some control over the system and the way this is done in thermodynamics is through a thermostat which is acting on the system and it's changing the properties of the system and 
what you can do is um, you can constrain the system and then if you want to get the final answer of everything that's possible you marginalize over it so this is like a controlled approach and it turns out that that controlled approach is an extremely useful thing to do in essentially every area of cosmology that I've dealt with. So one of the simplest examples of a constraint is to say we live in a standard model of con cosmology universe characterized by some small number of parameters, the basic six that uh, Planck has given such high precision on and that there are really no others and so there's a constraint that is operating however each of those things has an error and so there's a fluctuation around them which you might want to integrate if you're trying to do um, to, to really explore the uh, allowed range of the standard model and then you can also though treat um, all sorts of other kinds of constraints for example I could impose that in a simulation of a cluster, I have to have a cluster that sits in the center of that simulation and therefore I am going to impose that as a constraint and then I can sort of rank order these. So it's another kind of ordering of the system, more internal but equally useful in terms of uh, trying to get a parameter and one of the things I'm really keen about, Sarah, is the application of this to CO map where we characterize by control parameters the fields that we observe by making uh, measurements of those fields. Anyway, I won't talk much more about that, but I like the concept that you can use these ideas to connect things as disparate as, uh, as these different epochs of uh, cosmology. Okay, um, uh, let me just make a point of you're used to all of this because there's inverse temperature is the energy's uh, um, uh, coupling or uh, control parameter. Non-equilibrium dynamics have their control parameters which are forces, gradients. Um, if the control parameter drives out fluctuations in the pair, that gives you, if that's the only thing that's being observed, it gives you a Gaussian random field and the SFI turns out to look this way where C is the correlation function. So you can see there's a lot of richness here and I could um, say rather too much. But the thing is I hope to use some of this terminology as we go through some of the applications and so that's what I'm going to do. But before that I am going to talk about uh, what it is we actually do as cosmologists. Our goal is to take the huge number of bits of information that are coming to us maybe from the satellite or from a ground-based experiment and the volume is enormous. And almost all of that we don't care about. What we want to do is to uh, marginalize over everything except for the few basic, if you like, order parameters that we're actually trying to measure in the system. And so in the game, this is called um, information quality. And one of the ways that this is stated in information theory, at least the classical form, is uh, that you um, are trying to make minimum length uh, message codes, uh, which in a very uh, succinct way are indicating what complex phenomena might be coming from that. And, um, and we do that by processes of filtering, compressing, reducing, marginalizing, and it is a sheer uh, volume compression miracle that we can, given all of these bits of information, get this very high quality information. Um, I like to say that another example of high IQ things is uh, recipes, but equations themselves are uh, really good ways to encode and uh, compress data. Okay, so now we're going to just take a a big step uh, about the different entropy generation regions and I could show you a lot of fun and really great physics figures associated with the details of how our calculations are going but here is the broad brush stroke um, which is how most of the entropy and matter was created that ultimately gets into a uh, pl uh, quark uh, plasma uh, which then goes into a photon neutrino um, 
medium with a little bit of electron and neutron and proton. Um, and the physics behind that is the passage from coherence to uh, incoherent. The incoherent is like a reservoir system, a heat bath, that you say the variables of that system are high, high frequency or high spatial frequency fluctuations. So that what you have is sort of in a language which some people might really like is, um, because we've been chatting about it too, is a Bose-Einstein condensate that will ultimately break up into phonons. And that's essentially a, a not a bad way to think about the transition that's occurring. Um, and it is a, something that happens more or less all of a sudden over a short period of time. It doesn't coincide with the end of inflation. There's a period in which you still have the coherent thing uh, working its magic, except it starts to look a bit crazy. And then, once it looks crazy enough, coupling between lattice sites becomes large enough via nonlinear couplings to cause all of this uh, cascade of uh, high, um, higher uh, wave number uh, fluctuations. You can try and look at this as particle creation, but it really can be looked at as a highly classical problem. So uh, nonlinear couplings, uh, usually it's occurring um, in order to get it to happen fast enough through other interaction channels that are opening up that might have not been very important in the inflationary regime. Um, there ha are ways that you can get things to go a lot faster with other kinds of instabilities. Uh, and this is the arena in which I said um, there is uh, Kolmogorov Sinai entropy extremely important in the transition process, but that the entropy is not actually created until later. Um, Okay, I, I won't go into the rest of it. It's just that there have been a lot of interesting, surprising things that we found along the way. It's a very rich subject. It doesn't mean that the subject is solved. It's not even close to being solved because you have to be able to go from whatever the field theory content is that you're dealing with in the inflationary era into the standard model of particle physics and nobody knows how to do that, or at least I don't know how to do that. And um, uh, there is one case where maybe it could have worked, which is called Higgs inflation, but that doesn't seem to be working as well as one might, where the Higgs is playing the role of the inflaton. <clears throat> okay, but um, I'm going to yeah, take a step away from uh, the late universe. I'll come back to it before the end of the talk um, and talk about a few examples of this uh, cosmic information class of ideas to a few problems. Here I'm listing a bunch of them. The one that I have uh, mentioned is a, a way of looking at the development of the nonlinearity in the cosmic web through uh, uh, cosmic complexity developing naturally from a nearly Gaussian random field. And how do you look at that? And you have to look at it basically from a sequence of coarse grainings um, and, uh, uh, and constrained fields, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this gives the concept, which is uh, at first sight kind of crazy, which is the entropy in cold dark matter. And yet you know that this is going to be essentially the case because the cold dark matter, if that is the dominant thing that's keeping a galaxy together, must have something which is the analog of a pressure which is acting against the gravity. And that's what it does. It just does it by uh, being a cold phase space sheet, three dimensional, that wraps itself up into six dimensions, but uh, it really is a three dimensional sheet. And so then, if you look at it in a fuzzy way, you say, oh, there's entropy there. But in fact, if you could go down to the absolute details, there is no entropy. It's zero. Um, and it's just that that's the coarse graining aspect. Of course, that's you know, sort of well known to everybody, but it's a really interesting system to think about. Uh, so there's entropy in the cosmic web itself, entropy in protoclusters, and we found it to be a nice way to think about this. Um, 
There are many other things that are really fun, MHD turbulence, etc. But what I'm going to spend a short amount of time because I want to connect to what I began with, which is that I have to apologize that Planck has taken so long for the 2018 papers, but to just give you an idea of where we're going with that, and that's to show how Shannon information entropy flows from CMB bolometer time streams to marginalized cosmic parameters via Bayesian chains works. Oh, I was going to say a little bit more about the formation of entropy uh, and how things uh, work, uh, but I sort of did that at the beginning in words. So I'm going to introduce a figure of merit. This will probably come as no surprise, and it's probably a reworking of how you're all always thinking about the statistics um, in terms of uh, Bayesianism. But of course it uses the keyword entropy. Um, so uh, people have been interested in figures of merit for experiment. How well is the experiment doing? And uh, one way or another it's probably coming down to some measure of the parameter space volume that's allowed by the data and that it's a really good experiment if the parameter space volume has a sudden collapse as a consequence of the new experiment. Um, and so, uh, uh, of course, the mean log of the phase space volume is essentially the Shannon entropy. And so, therefore, using entropy makes a lot of sense in order to try and describe this way of looking at the development of data as a flow from an initial um, prior probability distribution to a final uh, posterior probability distribution. Now by the mid to late 1980s, it's sort of sad in a way, the inflation-based theoretical control parameter space, that is to say the basic cosmic parameters, was already defined. Uh, it includes the basic six that um, are the sort of standard things that have been measured, includes gravity waves, it includes curvature, <clears throat> lambda of course is in this mix, H naught is in this mix, derived parameter. And uh, back in that, those early days, even the concept of the dark energy being dynamical, this was before the discovery of dark energy of course, was already well in play. So theorists were already playing the game and mapping out the parameter space that was subsequently used. And you could say that the story since has been um, the theory prior, which didn't change so much, although there could have been big bifurcations and there weren't, to what have become these eye of the needle constraints where the flows have really concentrated us into what, of course, the name of the game is high precision cosmology. Um, and uh, the figure of merit I've already referred to. And so if you have two experiments, you can do Shannon entropy differences. Um, there are other associated figure of merits associated with entropy fluctuations. If your topic is, and I'm going to separate the two ideas, anomalies and tensions. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those as we go, but I'm going to uh, just give you an idea of this first thing, which is the development of uh, an emergence of parameters. I'd love to have time to chat with you about how a human being is not as great in terms of uh, at relevant bits as the WMAP satellite, but I'll skip over that. And show you a, a snapshot from about 2012 of how uh, in those days uh, I was envisaging the flow in uh, this uh, relative, well, this entropy difference, using as the baseline uh, the ACT telescope in conjunction with WMAP, looking back time minus 2000. So the first thing that hit big was bo boomerang, and that caused a huge cooling of the parameter space. The one we're going to target here is NS, which is the um, uh, slope of the primordial power spectrum and uh, every time that there is a step down here it's a, 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 a unit of one, it's a bit. A bit is a non-trivial thing in cosmology for these kind of marginalized signal parameter things because it means you've improved the error limits by a factor of uh, two-ish. Um, 
Okay, so look at this. It's bopping down. The WMAP satellite hit a little after 2000, 2003, and so there was a big cooling down. But we already had a fairly good indication of what NS was. Then uh, ACT didn't improve things that much. It was adding a little bit of lever arm. The current ACT data is helping. Uh, but here was a, um, a forecast, because this was before we hit with Planck, of where it could be if it got as much as 2.5 years of data, which in fact it did, which is a great thing. Um, and that would have caused this kind of cooling down, and it turns out that that's just about right. In other words, our forecasts were more or less what we were able to get. So a huge cooling down associated with the, uh, Planck, uh, uh, the, the, the Planck observations. Here, highly optimistic in terms of time, was the way the world would look for uh, the tensor to scalar ratio of Planck, uh, which has been rather disappointing in what it can do for, um, uh, for the tensor to scalar ratio, the spider experiment, Keck or Keck bicep, which is Shaolin's experiment, and uh, it says, oh yeah, we're gonna get this great uh, movement in 2014, didn't happen but it's an ongoing development, so just slide these things over. That's what happens all the time. This was a uh, satellite proposal. Uh, neither of these have been funded <laughs> uh, of, of where we might get to, and so uh, maybe with CMB stage four, that's possible. This was looking for the dark energy where the limits were there, but not great, into the period where the Euclid satellite and other large-scale structure things would play a role in conjunction with Planck. So in other words, what we see is a cooling flow with experimental time here. And you could say, well, this is just rewording what I already know, but it's kind of a fun way to think about it, at least I think so. Uh, here we are in 2018, and we're still looking at this side. It's the forecasting game. It's alive and healthy, and uh, many people in our subject spend an inordinate amount of time doing that forecasting. For good reason, they want to get funded. So now I'll take a, a movement into uh, two things which I'm separating in ideas. One is called anomalies, and the other are called tensions. Anomalies are things that all experiments agree on, uh, and they involve a relatively large entropy fluctuation from, in this case, the standard model, model of cosmology, which in this context, it's an equilibrium. What does that mean? It means that it's a standard model of com cosmology with each of the parameters having freedom, errors. And so what you're trying to do is to see if you have enough of a fluctuation to say it's not compatible with the equilibrium of the standard model of cosmology and I should shift to a new equilibrium, a symmetry breaking. Okay, well, that's a, you, you know how difficult that is. So, um, you, you know, it requires a lot of uh, detailed work to figure out that you've got things right. So you get an outlier of these fluctuations and you ask yourself first, are the systematics under control? And there's a lot of intense work on that and finger pointing and all of that. Uh, has the statistics been done right? Are there non-Gaussian tails that have been taken into account that uh, in fact um, uh, cause things not to be as improbable in terms of entropy fluctuations as you'd expect? Or can the anomaly rise to a solid uh, fluctuation that indicates that there is a new control parameter sitting out there, a new parameter for the theory that it has to deal with and it has no choice. And that's great. Um, and if it's five sigma, which is the figure of a requirement from particle physics, the trouble is the universe doesn't allow the reproducibility, um, that would involve 18 bits of information. That's a lot. And so uh, an issue is whether you can ever really get there. And it turns out that many of the anomalies, sadly, that we're dealing with are anomalies on large scales, which means that the fluctuations, if you like the allowed entropy fluctuations within the standard model, are so large and they will never get tiny because 
we live in uh, uh, just one realization of the universe and there are lots of possibilities that that can be drawn from. So it may be that we can, and most likely, that we can never really improve these anomalies to say there is no question that there is a new control parameter of the universe. And I'm going to show you an example of that and that will be the thing that I will spend the end times on. The other type of uh, things that we look for as we try and break the standard model of cosmology is to go beyond the standard model of cosmology and one of the manifestations is that one experiment's results do not agree with another experiment's results. And that could be because there is truth in both experiments and there just might be um, a new piece of physics. It could also be the same things that I pointed to up here. There could be systematics, which are not under control. It could be that there are non-Gaussian tails that have been, not, have been taken into account. And uh, 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 um, Wendy Friedman was here when I first arrived at Stanford and at one of our first discussion was the issue of non-Gaussian tails in the Cepheid variable or, uh, uh, determination of H0 and her view, which I think has emerged, is that that is an issue which has not been properly treated in the subject. I'm not saying that that's going to wash away the tension. I'm just saying you really have to do the statistics carefully if you're going to make big claims about an anomaly rising to a solid detection. From the point of view of the flow of information, what it means is that there is effectively a bifurcation. It's really like a potential that you start to see the development of two wells and then you end up being in one well and another well and what that's indicating is there's a symmetry breaking parameter that is beyond just the ordinary fluctuation. So it's a fine thing and so the H naught is an example of this. Um, okay, uh, another one of my fantastic long things. So the, the way I'm going to end up today not treating all of the topics is to take a very quick look into what I, partly because that's the work we did, uh, I regard as one of the great triumphs of Planck, of uh, not just trying to determine that there is a, uh, a uniform slope to the primordial fluctuations and a, uh, a given amplitude, but seeing how well that does. That is to say, treating it as an experimental thing to try and work it out. So I could wax eloquent on what the um, uh, degrees of freedom are from the early universe, um, what's the theory prior on the space of all of those degrees of freedom that uh, you might want to impose. It's pretty wide open if it originates in a landscape. Um, but here is the sequence. Begin inflate, into inflate, into end inflate, into preheat, into non-equilibrium heat plus entropy, into standard model of particle physics, quark gluon plasma, radiation dominated, into dark matter dominated structure for gravitational instability, into dark energy dominated now. That's the history of our universe as I've already described and as you know well. Uh, what are the order parameters for the early universe? Well, the remarkable thing is that we have compressed all of the information into two order parameters. One is an amplitude that characterizes the spectrum of fluctuations of the key variable that is describing the fluctuations back then. That it's a, first of all, the most important thing is that it was has been demonstrated to a fairly good approximation that it's a Gaussian random field, which means that everything can be characterized by a single uh, power spectrum. And then that there are two parameters that characterize that power spectrum, at least over the observable range, is also totally remarkable. Okay, and so you know what the great development from Planck is, and it's improved a bit, I can tell you in Planck 2018, but it's uh, non-trivial. We always play the systematic game. But 0.968 plus or minus 0.06 was our 2015 result, 5.6 sigma from unity. And of course, that's been highly celebrated, certainly by uh, uh, Andre Linde and, and Renata Kalash and everybody else, of course. But it's a really uh, remarkable thing that's been found from the data. 
Uh, one way to think about the evolution of the system, and this is something that I've been having a lot of fun here with uh, Eva and chatting about, is uh, this is a system that can be described from uh, um, the point of view of stochastic processes of coarse grain variables being fed by short distance quantum fluctuations and that that's the phenomenon, but I don't have time to go into that, but it is intimately related to the things that I was talking about of um, how entropy gets generated in the system. It's from a flow from a fine grain to coarse grain. So this is the key figure. And the reason I spent as much time as I have in trying to give you the background is so that you can appreciate this figure. So this is co-moving wave number, resolution, uh, spatial resolution. And this is amplitude of the power spectrum. And as I said, that seems to be all that's needed. So then the question is, what is that power spectrum? So we can do more than um, uh, try to say, oh, let's just throw in two parameters and determine them. And then maybe we'll make a little uh, bend in it and try and constrain that parameter. This is essentially a blind way of trying to look at all of the data a compression of that onto all of these different bands in K. And each one of these is a trajectory of allowed uh, developments. Um, and you, you can think about it this way. The way inflation works is it effectively the K that is being, the wave number that's being looked at by the data starts off as um, small and works its way to large. And then if we go here, and I can't even see it, that's where the end of inflation would occur. So we only get a small region, which is nine E foldings or so, and you can see that these allowed trajectories are in bands, and the bands grow at either end, and so the detailed information is over a much lesser band, which is here uh, a few times 10 to the minus 3 and starts to peter out at um, a few times um, 10 to the minus 1. <clears throat> and so what you should notice is that the bundle is really picking out a uniform slope over a very dominant region. And the issue is what's happening here. Well, it turns out that that fluctuation is about three bits away from the standard model of cosmology, which would be the one with that line to it. And, uh, and so it isn't enough of a fluctuation to be able to say there's clearly a deviation from the simple two-parameter standard model of cosmology, so you can do the statistics very well. Uh, and then the other thing I might point out here is that this, we were able to include the gravity wave data that was done by Sepp and Keck plus um, Planck that came out about the time of our 2015 papers. And so we were able to incorporate that. And that played a really important role because if you didn't have that information, you have a lot more freedom here. But if you put in that information, you see that these are allowed trajectories with constraints of what the gravity waves can be. And so you don't get them up here. You don't get trajectories that are up here. So there's already a pretty strong constraint. There is even a little bit of, there wasn't so much of a constraint from Planck because there was a degeneracy in the Planck data between what could happen here and what could happen here. And you really required the kinds of uh, polarization observations that were made uh, by Bicep and Keck. We are eagerly awaiting and we hope that we will get um, access to the new Bicep Keck results, which are imminent, but they've been imminent for a long time. So because um, in, uh, oh, I guess I better not skip forward. Um, I have sitting here, what do these look like for the 2018 Planck data? With, again, the Bicep Keck data from the EPIC that we did for the last paper. And so without giving too much away, it doesn't look radically different. It includes not just the temperature information, but includes all of the polarization information. And the thing that is really amazing is that this thing, this little fattening here, sharpens up enormously. 
that's an indication that um, instead of it being just an NS issue, it's a multi-band piece of information that says it's total lock-in. And that really is quite a startlingly beautiful result. This still exists in the data, it hasn't gone away, and the polarization doesn't do a lot in that region. Um, so it's going to look something like this, not dramatically different. There's a little bit of a push in information in this direction and this direction because we've improved with Planck the uh, polarization information so much. And so we have our constraints on, uh, on all of these parameters, even with all of the degrees of freedom that we've allowed to be given. So this picture is essentially trying to say that we have a snapshot of what was generating the stochastic fluctuations, the quantum fluctuations, over this broad dynamic range in the early universe, which is, well, here it's nine E foldings, you really get great information over a little bit less. Contrast that with what I told you at the beginning, that we only get one E folding of information, more or less, you get a little bit more from dark energy. And here, we're getting uh, nine. So, um, uh, it's an amazing thing to think that we know more about the ultra early universe than we do about our local universe around us. So I guess the last thing is that this is a picture of the way the universe looked back then, or at least is reconstructed from the polarization and the temperature data. And there are uh, features, it is not the feature of the map that you're used to looking at, because this has actually taken away a lot of that and you still see uh, the, fam the most famous anomaly in the sky, which is the WMAP cold spot. And it's still remarkable. It's remarkable, uh, let me see, because it's about a 15-bit fluctuation. And, um, and the anomalies, the other anomalies are only about three bits. That, and there are anomalies in the sky. Only about three bits. So this one is not something that can really arise from a Gaussian random field. One of the ideas that we have is that it might be explainable by phenomenon that can occur at the end of inflation um, that just happen to give superpositions that can fluctuate things up substantially. And so that would be adding other control parameters to the universe. Okay, um, I think I better go to the end because Eve is getting up. Don't worry, I didn't actually expect to get through all of this. <laughs> it's all just a grab bag of stuff. Uh, but there's neat stuff. But I will end, I have to end with something. <laughs> I have to end with the future fate of uh, entropy in the uh, cold death of the universe. Uh, so the 1800s had heat death. Uh, the future is supposed to be reemergence of uh, the absolute coherence. Um, and it beats the incoherence associated with the photons, neutrinos, gravity waves, etc. But the interesting point is that you can stretch it out all you want, but the entropy per particle is still there. It hasn't gone away. So there are 5.2 bits per photon in the cosmic microwave background and in some distant uh, uh, complete dark energy dominated future there will still be 5.2 bits per photon that will be hanging out there um, and that'll do. Thank you for that really excellent talk. Are there any questions? Okay. You, since you have shown three times uh, the, the result for MS, uh, does it mean that this is the result which will be announced a month later? Since I have what? Shown oh, three times? I don't... This MS equal to 0.968 plus minus, etc. And they were given three times. Uh, and so I, I wasn't counting. I can't believe... Of course I understand you were... No. Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, uh, 
It might not be surprising that given that the 2015 data release, we actually had the polarization data and we just said it isn't quite perfect, but we had the results from then and that things to, th we would have had to have done something really dramatically bad not to have nearly the same results. So, um, you know, you, you are not going to see radically altered things, but you will see somewhat improved error bars. Um, I have one. Uh, you were talking here about, I think, two distinct things. I mean, maybe it's N, but I think it was two. And one of them was physical entropy like you measure. And another was uh, uh, human perception entropy. In other words, you're, you're analyzing things, and when you learn something, there's a measure that goes down because right. you learned it. But uh, th those are, okay. So my question is, is that correct? Did I perceive that right? you talked about two different things? Well, um, I say those two different things are highly entangled. In, in a good way. But yes, they, it's true. Um, there are things... That's what's bothering me because it isn't yeah. true. What isn't true? It's absolutely not true. Physical entropy you measure, and human perception entropy you don't measure. It changes as a result of conversations. They're, they're different things. That you, you may... Okay, and I really don't want to get into this, but... Um, uh, I, what I ran across in trying to look at some of the stuff while here is um, another way of looking at quantum mechanics. They call it cubism. You probably know about it. It tries to inject Bayesianism as the way to really interpret quantum mechanics. And it does actually inject personal. I'm not saying it's got anything to do with my talk. I'm just saying that that kind of uh, um, set of ideas is actually in play in a broader way than what I tried to present here. But um, the, the real issue is, uh, in a sense, is what exactly do we mean by the relationship of information to entropy of physical systems? And I think that that's been a growing uh, uh, realization that they can be two aspects of the same thing. So that the Shannon entropy and uh, Boltzmann-Gibbs entropy are intimately related to each other. Okay, if there are no further urgent questions, let's thank Dick again. I really enjoyed that. I understood it so much better just because we've been talking. Yeah.